This is a reading of chapters 3 and 4 of Richard Wagamese's book, Indian Horse. All that I knew of Indian died in the winter of 1961, when I was eight years old. My grandmother Naomi was very old then. She was the matriarch of the small band of people I was born to. We still lived a bush life at that time. We had little contact with anyone besides the Zanagush at the northern store in Menaki, where we took our fur and berries, or the odd group of wandering Indians who stumbled across our camps. If there was ever a sign of an approaching stranger, our grandmother hurried my brother Benjamin and me off into the bush. We would stay there until the stranger departed, even if that took a day or so. There was a specter in our camp. We could see the shadow of this dark being in the lines of our mother's face. She would sometimes sit huddled close to the fire, clenching and unclenching her fists, her dark eyes, moons in the firelight. She never spoke at times like that, never could be comforted. I'd walk to her and take her hand, but she didn't notice me. It was as if she was under the influence of a potent medicine no shaman had the power to break. The specter lived in the other adults, too, my father and my aunt and uncle, but its most chilling presence was in my mother, the school, she would whisper then, the school. It was the school that Naomi hid us from. It was the school that had turned my mother so far inward she sometimes ceased to exist in the outside world. Naomi had seen the adults of our camp taken away as children. She'd seen them return bearing a sorrow that could not be reached. And when my grandfather died, she took her family back to the land, hoping that an Ojibwe life might heal them, ease their pain. Besides my brother, I had a sister that I never met. Her name was Rachel, and the year before I was born, she disappeared. She was six. The Zanagush came from across the water, our grandmother told Benjamin and me one time when we were hidden in the trees. It was the end of August, and we were coming back to the river from the summer camp near One Man Lake. Our canoes were full of berries. We planned to go to Menaki to sell them and buy supplies for the winter. We were tired. I never they thought they'd come at dawn. Me, I always thought the Xanagush slept like fat old bears, but they walked into our camp and I pulled my robe up over Benjamin, who was so small, and hid him from their view. But they found Rachel and they took her away in their boat. I stood on the rocks and watched them. Them, they had a boat with a motor, and when they rounded the bend in the river, I thought how fast things can vanish from our view. Her screams hung in the air like smoke from a green fire. But even they finally vanished, and all that was left was the wake from the boat slapping at the rocks at my feet. That's all I carry of her now, the wet slap of water and rocks. Every time I hear it, I remember the dawn, the white men came and stole Rachel from us. So we hid from the white men. Benjamin and I developed the quick ears of bush people. When we detected the drone of an engine, we would run. We'd grab the old lady's hand and scuttle into the trees and find a place to secret ourselves away until we knew for certain that there was no danger. I learned English at the same time I learned Ojibwe. My father taught me to read from Xanagush books, taught me to form the sounds the letters built with the tip of his finger as my guide. They felt hard, those white men words, sharp and pointed on my tongue. Old Naomi fought against it, trying to throw the books in the fire. They come in different ways, them, the Xanagush, she said. Their talk and their stories can sneak you away as quick as their boats. So I grew up afraid of the white men. As it turned out, I had reason to be. In 1957, when I was four, they got my brother Benjamin. The old lady and I were gathering roots in the glades back of the trees that stood against the river. The men and my brother were at the foot of the rapids setting the gill nets. The airplane came out of the west and we didn't hear it soon enough. Naomi and I made it to the Clifton in the rocks, but the men and my brother had nowhere to go. The plane cut them off and we crawled up out of our crevice in the rocks and watched as those men from the plane lowered a canoe and forced my family's canoe to the opposite shore. They had guns, those Xanagush. I think that if they hadn't, my father and my uncle would have fought them off and we would have run into the back country but they took my brother at gunpoint and pushed him up into the plain. My mother collapsed on the long, flat rock that reached out into the river at our camp. No one could move her. She lay there for days, and it was only the chill of the first autumn rains that got her up on her feet and back to the fire. She was lost to me then. I could see that. She was gaunt and drained from days of weeping, a tent of skin over her bones. 
When Benjamin disappeared, he carried a part of her away with him, and there was nothing anyone could do to fill it. My father tried. He never left her side for weeks, but now that she had lost two children, she would not speak anything except the school. The words like a bruise in the air. So he left her, and he and my uncle paddled off down the river to sell the berries. When they returned, they brought the white men with them in brown bottles. Spirits, Naomi called them, bad spirits. Those spirits made the grown-ups move in strange, jerky ways, and their talk was twisted. I fell asleep to evil laughter. Sometimes my mother lurched to her feet and danced around the fire, and the shadow she flew against the skin of the tent was like the outline of a skeleton. I clutched my robe tight to my throat, lay across the space my brother once filled, and waited for sleep to claim me. On clear nights, the old woman and I would sit on the rocks by the edge of the river, the stars pinwheeled above, and we could hear wolves calling to each other. Naomi told me stories of the old days, told me about my grandfather and the medicine ways he carried. Good medicine, powerful Ojibwe medicine. The river wound serpentine, radiant in the light of the northern moon. In its curling wash, I sometimes thought I could hear songs sung in Ojibwe honor songs raising me above the hurt of my brother's absence. That voice sustained me as did the firm, warm hand of Naomi on the thin blade of my shoulder. Chapter 4 After Benjamin disappeared, my family left the bush and the shores of the river. We canoed out one day and left the camp behind. My grandmother came too, though she'd argued against the move. My mother seemed almost weightless by now. I was always surprised that she'd left footprints. There was nothing to her but air. Her eyes were empty, and she walked bent over like an old woman. My father bore it all in stoic silence, but there was an angry arc when he swung an axe, a more vicious slice of the knife when he skinned out a deer. This energy, so heavy and thick, was the opposite of my mother's. Both my parents had taken to the Xanagush drink, and we left the bush in pursuit of it. We followed the whiskey to the transient camps of the half-breeds who gathered on the discard lands around sawmills, waiting for the bits of work that were sometimes tossed their way, Indian work. That's what the mill folk, bil, mill folk called it. Men and boys would plow off into the bush to cut deadfall trees and haul their lengths to cleared stretches where the skidders could get to them. It was their job to clear the trees that made dropping the prime timber more difficult for the white fallers. There were no chainsaws. The breeds and the Indians cut everything by hand with sweet saws and axes. It was brutal work for little pay, and what was paid out was drunk off quickly. There weren't many kids in those camps. Most of them had been spirited away by the government men. The fact that no one ever came for me was more a testament to the invisible nature of our lives than to any good luck. I hauled a wagon around the rutted, muddy roads that led through the tent village and out to the desolate edges of the town where the poor whites lived to sell firewood we kids broke by hand. Broke wood breeds. That's what the Xanagush at the meals, mills called us, broke wood breeds. Our lives became the plod from one tent village to another. Sometimes there'd be an abandoned tar paper shack that we could call home, but for the most part we lived with others as displaced as we were, in canvas tents strung in a circle around a central fire. We'd share the warmth and whatever food we had. I learned to snare rabbits and steal chickens. I grew to hate the stink of sulfur at the same time I learned to endure the stench of roasted dog, the bite of the pine gum tea washing down the lard sandwiches that were our staple. Naomi told me stories, kept me away from the adults when they were in the grips of the drink. She showed me how to skin the squirrels and woodchucks we would sometimes catch in those thin woods. We settled in a reddit in the winter of 1960. There was a lot of work for men then. We managed to buy a wood stove for our tent and pass the deep snow moons in a comfort we'd forgotten it could exist. With this infusion of hope, my father drank less. There was more money for food and I stopped snapping off the ends of branches that stuck up out of the snow to haul about in my wagon. By spring, I'd grown taller, elastic, and wiry. That spring, we gathered mushrooms and greens and wild onions. A stream led from a bog lake to the main river and my grandmother showed me how to lay out a burlap bag and haul in the suckers that ran up the creek to spawn. I learned to clean them with swift swipes of a knife and use the guts for bait on night lines I set out to drift in the current of the big river. 
We smoked those fish. Sometimes we'd slap thick coats of clay around them and bake them in the fire. My grandmother used the ribs of them for needles to sew buttons on my battered shirts. It began to feel as though we might forge a life for ourselves there on the edges of that rough-hewn town. Summer came. My mother sat with us at the fire most nights, even though she still carried with her such a deep sadness. So that's chapters three and four of Richard Wagamese's book, Indian Horse.